Welcome. This is the part of the service where we celebrate the Lord's table. Jesus instructed the disciples to take a piece of bread and a cup of wine and to remember his body and blood that was given for us at the cross. So each morning here at GBC, we take a small cracker and a cup of juice and we take a time of reflection on the gospel and use this time to remember him. I'll be reading from Romans 8 today, so you can turn there. And if you don't have a Bible, there are men in the front with Bibles, and they'd love to put one in your hand. Just raise your hand, and they'll bring one to you. Two weeks ago, one of the pastors of the church where Jenna and I met passed away. On Thursday, she and I went to his memorial service. And at that service, his son Scott, one of my dear friends, read from Romans 8. As he was reading, I was struck by how clearly that passage delivers comforting truths about the gospel. Over the course of the remainder of the service, we heard stories of a man that was transformed by the gospel and dedicated his life to discipleship. It was a sweet, sad, and convicting time. Since then, that passage has been on my mind. So this morning, I want to remind us of three truths of the gospel that will comfort, convict, and cause us to worship our Savior from Romans 8. The first truth is that before, we, before Christ, we were characterized by death and hostility to God and an inability to please God. Read with me, starting in verse 5. For those who were according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. When we live a life without the Spirit, God allows our flesh to rule within us, and that brings death. Some of us may have thought we were able to please God. I've heard many people say things like, I'm a mostly good person, or I've done more good than bad, so I'll be okay. But these people are without peace. The passage is clear that the life according to the flesh brings death. And there's another group mentioned in this passage, those according to the Spirit. These are ones who have been transformed by the Spirit. Paul is referencing people who have submitted their lives to Christ, and Christ, in turn, has given them an ability they never would have had on their own. Christian, this is you, and the next truth about the gospel will cause you to worship the Savior. The next truth about the gospel is that for those of us that are adopted children of God, he will give an immeasurable inheritance. Jump down to verse 14. For as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption, as sons by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 5 references those that are living according to the Spirit. And here in verse 14, Paul reminds us of the inheritance that comes to those living according to the Spirit. We are adopted children of God. In today's world, I don't think we usually understand the significance of being an heir. In many places, I think it's downplayed. But when my friend Scott heard the legacy of his dad during that service, it was a privilege to be an heir to a man that impacted so many lives. Scott got to see a man that finished well and served his savior with his life from the time he was 24 until he passed away at 70. And Scott felt a great privilege and comfort being his heir. As Christians, we're heirs to the one that created the universe. Colossians 1 says that he is before all things and in him all things are held together. Our spiritual father holds every single molecule in his hand. Isaiah 45 says that every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance to Yahweh. And look again at verse 17. It says that we also will be glorified with him. What a privilege that will be. 
as adopted children of God, we will get an, inherit, an immeasurable inheritance. And the last truth of the gospel that is there to comfort, convict, and cause us to worship our Savior is those that are adopted children, the trials and sufferings of today are incomparably insignificant to eternal glory. Look at verse 18. For I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What trial was on your mind this week? Think of it for a second. What difficult situation took up your thought life? Some of those were very hard. Maybe your work is overwhelming and you don't even know what to do. Maybe you're fighting illness and you're tired of the fight. Maybe sin is rearing its ugly head and you're weary of the battle. The encouragement of this verse is that when compared to the glory of eternity, these difficulties are but a speck. The scale can't even weigh the difference. Take a moment this morning and meditate on the glory of Christ that has been revealed to us and try to think about what will be revealed. That is a sweet, sweet comfort during today's trial. So as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we need to reflect on these truths of the gospel. We need to remember that before Christ, we were characterized by death, hostility, and an inability to please God. And that as adopted children, we will get an immeasurable inheritance and that the sufferings of today are insignificant compared to eternal glory. However, maybe you're one of the people that were referenced in the beginning. You're one who is living their life according to the flesh. Maybe you have not put your trust in Christ and his death on the cross, and you see clearly that you are not living a life according to the Spirit. We're glad you're here, but these truths should not be a comfort to you, but a warning. These truths are truths that should convict you and cause you to be concerned about what your eternity looks like. And so I ask as the men pass the bread and the cup that you let those pass by, but spend this time contemplating what eternity will look like for you. And if you want to talk to me or one of the other elders or anyone that brought you, we'd love to talk to you about our Savior and what it means to be an heir to Christ. Men, come forward. You may take communion on your own, and I'll come back and close our time in prayer.